He said, uh, pay attention to my times and pay attention to the threes. So, so um, I started studying because he gets me on those tracks and I study. And uh, what I'm going to read to you is, you know, during, uh, in the history of time, uh, things have been changed. Originally, God had a calendar that he set up at creation, and he gave it to his people, the Jews. They had his calendar, and they were operating on his calendar, and the, the, the festivals that they have, and, and Sabbath that they, that they worship on Sabbath, all these things were according to the calendar of God. Um, and on the Council of Nicaea, that was uh, during the Roman time, the calendar was changed because they were trying to include everyone and all religions, all religions. And so uh, they changed it. And we still operate on that calendar. That's why I was talking earlier. I said that the Jewish calendar, the New Year starts on the September 25th, but ours doesn't start for a couple months. So the question is, which calendar is God paying attention to? Which time is right? We all pray the New Year in on our New Year, but but... Is God, is he still looking at that time and that season? This is a good question. Now, it's always time with God. But God never did say that his time is invalid. He set those times, and I feel like if we decide to keep Sabbath on Sabbath, which, by the way, you're here, and it's Sabbath, so it's one of his high holidays. I, we've been, and I know everyone's got their views on that. Well, Cheryl, that's old stuff. Why, why are we even doing that? God has been stirring me to start learning because I want to know him. I want to know him more, and, and he leads me into knowing him. And what he's been leading me into is to understand his patterns. When you know his patterns, then you can know God, how he thinks. Everything he does is a pattern. And when you read your word in the Old Testament, that's why the Old Testament is still valid because there's patterns in the Old Testament that show us exactly what it means in the New Testament. And if you don't have that understanding, you don't have a full revelation. I want a full revelation. I'm hungry. I'm hungry for full revelation. So I want to know more, and I want to know him more. I'm always, I want to know you more. I want to know you more, God. I want to know you more. So he, and he's so faithful. He loves us all so much. I mean, I don't care who you are, from the smallest to the youngest. If you're hungry to know him, I don't care if you're a pastor of a great church or if you're Elizabeth Ladeau, okay? A, a young, how old are you? 13. He will reveal himself to you if you seek him. He, he desires you to seek him. He, and it's so amazing because every time he reveals more to me, I'm like, and I'll share it with TJ, I'm, he told me this, can you believe? And I'll cry sometimes. He told me this, and I know it's right on because it's in the word. It's right here. Boom, 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 boom. It's right. He's telling me. Me, Cheryl, who are you? Nobody. I'm just a lady. That's it. I'm a lady. You want me to give you a big old title? I'm not going to do it. I, I'm, I'm, I'm one of the bride. I'm one of the bride. That's who I am. I'm one of the bride. You're one of the bride, too. I'm trying to empower you. I want you to understand who you are. You're one of the bride. You're part of the body. You can, he wants to talk to you. The only thing holding you back from God, giving you fresh revelation. Okay, so... Who knows who Bill Johnson is? Raise your hand if you know who he is. Okay. Bill Johnson, he's amazing. He's got revelation. Woo! It's awesome. You read his books, you have to read them more than once. It's like, yeah. Okay, I love Bill Johnson. His revelation's amazing. And, and God's giving me revelation. And I'm like, I've never heard Bill Johnson. But I bet you he would love this. And it's blowing me away because I honor that man. He's taught me so much through his books and, and meetings. I honor him. I honor him. But why in the world would God do this for me? I know people don't like me saying that, TJ. I'm trying to empower you. I want you to know it doesn't matter who you are. God is going to reveal himself to you if you ask. Matthew 7, 7. Ask and you shall receive. Seek and you shall find. Knock and the door will be open to you. And then he says it in because everyone that asks receives. And everyone that seeks finds. And everyone that knocks, the door's open. Man, he's repeating himself. He repeated himself three times, and then he repeated himself three times again. I'm on the number three here. And God's a God of patterns. just want to tell you that. So, <clears throat> so as he was revealing to me this, he told me, he said, uh, do you know, understand the season that we're in right now? So I'm going to read some stuff to you. So the Jewish calendar is not flat like ours is. You turn a page, it's flat. 
you know, we, I have a teacher, actually, that teaches me this. So I can't send you to her. Her name is Wanda. She answers my calls. <laughs> She's from Texas. The Jewish calendar looks like a spiral that goes up to heaven. It starts on earth at the beginning of time and it ends in heaven. And she said, it looks like a ladder. And I said, oh, a DNA strand? She said, oh, that's good. It looks like a DNA strand. So could it be that we're climbing corporately closer and closer to the very DNA of God himself? Because oneness is how this is going to end. And, and ask, ask me, how close are we, Cheryl? I believe we're so close that we're about to, I mean, we're so close. We're about to break through. Some have broke through. Some, I'm telling you, there are people regularly being transferred in the spirit, preaching, and they end up in China. It's happening now. People are walking in the water right now. There's testimonies that I'm reading, and it's happening right now, right now. I've got someone here, Bernadette. She's getting transferred in the spirit regularly. You can believe it or not. You can just, whatever you want to do. But see, it's only going to happen to those who believe. Jesus couldn't do many miracles in Jerusalem because they're like, hey, that's Jesus, the carpenter. What? What? Right? So when you're around those people who are familiar with you, sometimes they're not going to receive it. But let me tell you something. There's a world waiting for the manifested sons to arise. For you to become that manifested son, you got to believe. When God says, I'm going to hit your land, I'm going to hit Kern County, someone's got to believe. If you'll believe it, then you get to be part of it. God's about to hit your land. There's some people here, and they are going to get, woo! Okay. <clears throat> In the spirit, get ready. I believe that we are right now in this season living in the thinnest place that, that human beings have ever lived, that we are so close on that ladder that we've been climbing, Jacob's ladder. From now on, from now on, you'll see the angels ascending and descending on the Son of Man. Who's that? Oh, wait, is that me? Yeah, I'm the body of Christ. Follow me. Do you got it? Do you know who you are? Do you know what you're supposed to be seeing? Do you know why you're supposed to be seeing angels? You're his body. He said, from now on, you're going to see the angels ascending and descending on the Son of Man. Wait, Cheryl, did you just call yourself Jesus? Kind of. I called myself the body of Christ. And that's who you are. Maybe, maybe I'm a fingernail and Alice is a leg. I've got to give her a good spot. She's awesome. 2 Corinthians 3.18, But we all with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, just as the Lord, the Spirit. We're being transformed. And it's corporate. Now, it's individual and it's corporate. But if we would all agree together and go up together, I'm telling you, something's about to break. Something's about to break. So one day is as a thousand years to God, right? That's what he said. One day equals 1,000 years according to biblical numerics. We now stand two days or 2,000 years this side of Calvary and have already stepped across the threshold into the third day, the new millennium. And that's what I wanted to share with you before I even start here. Um, so on 20, on year 2000, Y2K, they thought the world was going to end. People, I, I remember, I was younger back then, and people were running outside and thinking, oh, no, the world's going to end now. And it didn't end because the third day had started, the third millennium. I know yet my daughter doesn't like to hear this because you guys want to get married and have a family and live your life. But the, the third day has begun, and if you're going to look at the Bible, Jesus rose up from the grave the third day, right? And uh, Luke 13, 32, he said unto them, Go ye and tell that fox, Behold, I cast out devils and do cures today, and tomorrow, the third day, I shall be per perfected. Was he just talking about himself? Or is this a pattern for the future church? It's probably both, because that's how God does it. It's a pattern. And be ready against the third day. For the third day, the Lord will come down in the sight of all the people upon Mount Sinai. Haggai 2.9, the glory of this latter temple shall be greater than the former, says the Lord of hosts. In Acts 10.40, him God raised up the third day and showed him openly. John 2.1, and the third day there was a marriage in Cana of Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. 
We heard him say, I will destroy this temple that is made with hands, and within three days I will build another made without hands. That was before he died. He died, he rose up, and then there was a temple without, made without hands. Whoa, was it him? Okay, now I'm going to move on. Here we go. In Exodus 25, 8, and let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them. Um, Acts 17, 24, God that made the world and all the things therein, seeing that he is Lord of heaven and earth, dwells not in temples made with hands. There's you another conundrum right there. <laughs> Isaiah 66, 1, thus says the Lord, the heaven is my throne and the earth is my footstool. Where is the house that you will build unto me? And where is the place of my rest? For all those things has my hands made. And all those things has been, says the Lord, but to this man will I look. Even to him that is poor and of a contrite spirit and trembles at my word. Hmm. Sounds like from the very beginning, he always intended for there to be a temple to be built, a dwelling place from the very beginning of time. And then he tells you in Isaiah, way back in the Old Testament, exactly what he intended. It wasn't a building. It was man. It was always man. There were three times that the temple, and I've talked about this in Firestorm before, that the temple was dedicated and the glory fell, okay? The first temple was when Moses, God gave him the Ten Commandments, and he said, I want you to build me a temple, a place that I can dwell in. And they built tents according to the blueprint of God. It was very specific. If you study this, it's very specific. You don't say of unless you're supposed to say of. You don't speak unless you're supposed to speak. The priests are barefoot, which I thought was cool because I'm always barefoot in here. Even my dreams, I'm barefoot. I'm like, why am I barefoot? I don't understand. I get it. The temple priests were always barefoot. They did not wear shoes. Now you understand a little, much, a little more why God, when Moses was before the fiery bush, he said, take off your shoes. You're on holy ground. It's part of his plan. It, it, it is a symbolism of holiness. Of, of saying, I don't have an office. It's just me, God, little old me, my little toes standing before you. So Moses built it just like God said, and on dedication of the temple, the glory of God fell on that temple place, and no man could enter in. That's number one. Second time, the second time, David yearned to build a temple for God. And he said, God, let me make you a temple. And God said, okay, I'm gonna get, here's the blueprint. But then he said, you can't do it. You can't do it because he had too many wars. He said, look, we're going to have your son do it. So Solomon built the temple, and it was the most glorious edifice anyone had ever seen. And on dedication of the temple, the glory of God fell in that place, and a man could not even enter in because of the glory. It's happened one more time since then. In the upper room, on the day of Pentecost, 120 people were up praying and waiting for that promise. They didn't know what it was from on high that Jesus promised. They waited for 10 days. That's interesting, 10 days. That's a corporate number, 10. <laughs> it took 10 people to open a gate. Wow, that was really good. I didn't get that before. And then... The Holy Spirit fell on them, and it was as if tongues of fire settled on each one of their head, and they spoke in tongues as the Holy Spirit gave them utterance. And 3,000 souls in the city, 3,000 souls of people that crucified Jesus in Jerusalem, the ones that put him to death, the ones that spit on him, the ones that mocked him and made fun of him, 3,000 souls in Jerusalem came running and said, what's going on? And they got saved. What must I do to be saved? Why did they do that? Why? Because those people were acting crazy. And it looked like a miracle to them. It wasn't normal. And you know, if you're Pentecost, and if you're not, I love you anyway. We all love you. It doesn't matter what brand you are, okay? Because I'm not necessarily Pentecost. I'm, I, I don't claim it. Any, any brand anymore. Spirit-filled Christians, you need to let it out. I don't care what brand you belong to. I don't care if it's Baptist, Catholic. I don't care what you belong to. Let it out. The world is looking for something real. 
when the fire hit the temple and those the, all the people all the people of Israel bowed and oh my goodness they saw fire come down from heaven like Elijah's sacrifice remember the prophets of Baal I mean it was an awe awe inspiring moment it was your jaw dropping moment this is real picture this is real this is not just a story it landed in the temple the same way Oh, that it happened in front of the prophets of Baal. It landed, and the people saw it, and they were amazed. They were in awe, and they, the Bible says they bowed down and worshiped. No one stood. No one stood. The God, the God of our forefathers, the God of Abraham, he is the God. He is the God. He is the creator. He's God, and he's your God. It's, it's, it's really amazing to see those two temples and how they were dedicated and then be where we are now and know that the dedication in the upper room has hit me. The fire is on this altar. It's already hit me, and I'm living it. And it's supposed to spread. It's supposed to hit the temple. It's supposed to be where the man can't walk anymore. I can't move. I can't move, and I can't walk because the glory of God has filled the temple. That's me. And it's him, and it's his fire that consumes me. Oh, I'm sorry if I'm an emotional Christian. No, I'm not. I'm not sorry because my God is love. And my God is passion. My God has eyes of fire. His eyes are fire. It's from the very core of his being. The Bible says my, our God is a consuming fire. My God is a fire. He's glory and he's fire. Isaiah saw him and he looked like glory. He was scared out of his mind. He was scared. He fell as a dead man. Ah, do you remember the story? And he said, oh, I'm unclean, I'm unclean. But see, we're not unclean anymore. We've got Jesus. The blood of Jesus has already cleansed us. We're the temple. And the glory of God has hit you if you're baptized in the Holy Spirit. And if you're not, get baptized in the Holy Spirit. It's for you. This baptism is the thing. This is what's going to throw it over. This is the thing that's going to cause the glory. When you recognize what you have and you bow down to God and you don't let the flesh walk around anymore, Kill that thing in you and put it on the altar. Kill it. It's not okay. There's five wise and five foolish versions. Five of them are going to make it. They've got oil in their lamp, and the other five are busy. I want to watch my football game today. I, I'm busy. I'm busy. And then they're going to go to little Elizabeth. Do you have oil? Do you have, can you pray for me? Can you pray, can you pray for me? Because I didn't pray all week. I didn't pray all week, Elizabeth. Do you have enough oil for me? And Elizabeth's like, well, I'm trying but I really only got enough oil for myself. I know, ouch. It hurts me too. <laughs> ouch. It's the truth. Church, we're in a serious time here, and I'm telling you where we are right now. We're in a season of you decide. And if you, I don't know how something could still be alive in there. I'm talking about sins. I don't know how they could still be alive when the fires hit you. I guess the question is, are you going in and out of it? Sometimes you're going and giving your sacrifice, and then you're like, woo. I mean, what are we doing? It's, we are a living sacrifice. It's a nonstop. Did you know the fire was supposed to be perpetually on the altar? God lit it from heaven. And you were, they were to never let it go out. It was an abomination to let the fire go out. What does that mean to the church? Oh, the Holy Spirit's not important. Have you heard that? Yeah, it's not important. They said the salvation prayer, it's good. Really? Really? Maybe that is enough. Maybe that's enough. Is it? Is it the fire? Is it the fire? Is, is it consuming you? I'm not saying they don't have the Holy Spirit. There's a baptism needed. There's a baptism of fire that's needed. It's passion. It'll cause fire in your eyes and fire in your heart. It'll cause you to want to know him because this is salvation. This is eternal life, to know him. This is eternal life. I'm quoting the word, to know him. You're like, wait a minute, I thought it was Romans Road. Yes, you better say the Romans Road. So the, the Israelites, I've learned so much, especially in the Day of Atonement. That was a biggie. But they would, they would sin in the Old Testament Maybe just one little thing. Oh, I lied. You know, some, let's say something little. And then they would go and they'd sacrifice an animal without blemish. They would have to sacrifice that animal themselves, not the priest. You know how we're all waiting for our preacher to do it for us? I want you to tell me I'm bad to make me feel guilty so that I'll go up to the altar. That's not how they did it. Huh? That's not how it worked. 
The priest was the one that handled the blood. They had to kill it themselves. Please listen to what I'm saying. This animal, it's like the sins of these people would be on the animal. Let's say it's a little sheep and say Cheryl lied. And I'm like, okay, okay. This animal is going to carry that lie to the altar for me. And I don't want to kill an animal. Okay, guys, I'm not, I'm not saying I condone that at all. That's very bloody. I would never, I don't think I'm cut out for that. <laughs> okay. But they had to do it. Now, God is not into pain. He, he made sure that it had to be a sharp knife. Like, it wasn't that he's a God that's like, I like blood. That's not the deal. There's the only way, one way to cover your sin, and that was blood. They had to do it themselves. And then the priest would take that offering and take it to the altar of sacrifice. And then when it, if it, it cannot be alive on the altar of sacrifice. If it was alive, it was disqualified. It doesn't count. In other words, your sins aren't forgiven. You're out of there. Did you know that? That's a big deal. <laughs> That's a big deal. I don't think we know that. I think we, I think, I don't think our minds are like that. But when you study and you realize, oh, my goodness, you can see the pattern and God made those patterns for us to know now who we are. That was the pattern for Moses. That was the pattern for Solomon. That was the pattern when Herod built the temple. And if we're the temple and we're the living temple, that pattern is for us too. But Jesus did it for us. But the Lord needs a living body that is walking pure before him. It cannot be both. We know that there's going to be five wise and five foolish, and we've got to make sure we know which side we're on. Now, Repentance is there, and we need to use it. We need to use it. Jesus is our high priest. You need to use it every single day, and I do every day, every day. God, if there's anything in me, get it out. But it's time for the church to not be so nonchalant about it. And I know if you're at Firestorm, you're not nonchalant. You wouldn't be here. You know, ah, it's no big deal. I'll cuss in. I'll ask forgiveness later. God really is looking for someone that's willing to walk and live for him as a living sacrifice every day. And you can do it. You can do it because he loves you, and you can do it because he gave you the Holy Spirit. See, we couldn't do it before. The Old Testament, they couldn't do it because we can't do it on our own. And that's why he gave the Holy Spirit. He said, I'm going to write the, my laws on their hearts. This is going to take care of it. I'm going to write my laws on their hearts and on their minds. And they're going to be a people unto me, and I'm going to be a God unto them. And they're going to be able to go right up to me into my presence. And it's an amazing thing. And we need to know just how amazing it is. We need to honor this thing that he's done for us and not be so nonchalant about, about sin and eating what the world's giving to you, you know? I mean, TV, Facebook, it's all out there. It's constantly coming at you. You're constantly eating, whether you realize it or not. Your spirit's eating. You're eating. Commercials, it's getting into your spirit constantly. Music on the radio. They didn't have this hundreds of years ago. They didn't. It's constantly being filtered in. Don't you think the enemy's kind of trying to set us up to not be who God's called us to be? To get us to forget? Just, cause, just be a human. Just be a normal human being. They're telling you what normal looks like. Normal looks like sleeping around. Um, friends. Right? Right? Sleeping around. It's fun. It's happy. Ooh. And then people like... That's what life's like. That's what my life should be like. You're looking at it, and you compare yourself to it. That's not what the Word says. And it's a trap of the enemy. It's a trap. And we can s throw grace around all we want, but that's, that, to me, that's like spitting in God's face. Should we sin because grace abounds? God forbid. God forbid. But we have grace. We have grace. And God is working on the church, and he is getting us into a place. That's why we're here, to step into his glory, to step into God, to step in oneness with him. I've said this many times. We're called to be his temple. We're called to be his bride. Okay? We're called to be his body. So these are three different ways to look at it. But do you think Jesus, when he comes back to marry his bride, is going to come after a bride that is not in love with him? Why would he do that? He said, be not equally yoked. It's in there. You think he's going to come and be unequally yoked? When he's in love, he's so in love that he, he, he died a violent death for his bride. Violent death. It was horrible. It was horrible. 
do you think he's going to come after a bride that's not willing to die herself, to live unto him? No, I don't think so. I don't think so. And it's, there's a dividing of time. We're here in this time where the line's been drawn. And now, I've, as long as grace is here, you always have a chance to step over and go, I'm going to be on the glory side, you know. Whatever these sins that hold you back or strongholds in your mind that hold you back from, from, from really knowing him, from really letting him have, it, have all those things, you're in grace. And he's still transforming us into his image from glory to glory. Hallelujah. Because I'm still being transformed. I am not perfect. I need the blood of Jesus. But I really do love him to the point I love him. I really love him. It's not, it's not a fake thing. It's real. I, I love him, and I don't want to hurt him. I, I want to know him. I really, really do. I want to know him. And, and I really, really yearn for him, like the bride at the gate, waiting, waiting. I, I really, and, and every one of us need to be in this place. I, I'm hungry for his presence. I'm hungry. For, I, I, come on, Jesus, I just want to fill you. Just touch me. Talk to me. Speak to me. Let me see your eyes. Let me see your face. Give me another dream. He's been giving me dreams every night this week, every single night because I ask, wow, why would he do that? Because he loves me because I'm his bride. He loves me, and he'll do it for you too. It's just where's, where's our mind? Where's our mind? I've already talked about the altars. The altar was the heart of the temple, the heart. And all the service in the temple was around the altar, the heart. So this would be our altar, our heart. I'm just going to skip all that. This is what Wanda says from uh, my, my teacher from Texas. She said, when, when a person put their, their sacrifice on the, on the altar... It was not a painful thing. The pain was the decision before they put it on the altar. That was, it, it was a glorious thing. It was a blessing. It was considered an amazing blessing to put, oh, oh, that's wonder, it's a wonderful thing because it's a finishing. It's a killing of that thing, that thing, whatever it is. It's a killing of that sin, that thing, and it's gone. And then they were clean. And then they got to partake of the blessing a lot of times and there's different sacrifices for different things, different seasons and times. But then the family would take that food, and then they would eat it together, and it was something they were blessed from. God didn't just randomly kill, kill animals. It was something they would eat later. So they got to share in it. It was a, a ritual. It was part of the ritual. Sometimes the priest would eat it with them. You know how we take uh, communion now. So with the Jews, eating is a worship. It's one of the highest forms of worship, eating food, because they were eating the way God told them to eat, and a lot of their worship, actually some of the highest form of worship was eating food, because they were eating with God. So we could do that ourselves. You know how we pray over our food, God bless this food. What, what if he was sitting there with you? What, what if our heart was in this place? He's right here. He's right here with me. That's the state of the heart of the people when they eat. It was part of their worship. There is another altar in the temple. This one is the one that makes me cry because I, I see something in it. And, um, and it's the altar of incense. So you have the outer court. That's where the big altar was. And then you go into the inner court, the inner chamber, and there was the candelabra, the, the menorah, and then the showbread, the altar of incense. The altar of incense stood right, right in front of the Holy of Holies. It was like right here. And... It was gold. It was about this high. Um, he said, put a crown of gold on it when he told them to make it, and two rings on either side so that you can carry it with gold staves. Um, the incense, the, the priest was to go in there and put all, um, incense on it day and night, morning and night. And the Lord said, you shall put incense on this day and night. I believe, this is just Cheryl Scrimshire, okay? I've never read it anywhere, but... The more I read about this altar, the more I saw it as the bride, as a type and shadow of the actual bride standing before the throne. 
because he said, put a crown on its head. And he used the term crown. And he said, and overlay it with gold. And the incense, and we know that our prayers are incense that go up before God. It's in Revelations. Day and night, our prayers go up. And so I, be, I believe it was, I believe it was, it's the bride. Standing there, standing right there at his throne, day and night, with incense going up. Isn't that beautiful? His throne was in the Holy of Holies. That was his seat. Okay, so Wanda says, the word sacrifice is very poorly translated into English. In fact, we have no English equivalent. The word sacrifice in Hebrew means, it, it's pronounced korban, and it literally means to draw near. And we don't think of it like that, do we? To draw near. So when I give him one more thing, he reveals one more thing in Cheryl's, like that little sassy attitude's got to go, Cheryl. When you're driving down the road, that little sass that comes out of you, you get, I want you to kill it, kill it, and put it on the fire and let me burn it up. Okay, God, okay. But every time I do it, every time I obey, because obedience, obedience. Every time I obey him, I say, okay, I'll take it. It means draw near. It doesn't mean sacrifice. It means draw near. So our mentality, even our mental state is wrong. Sacrifice in their language means draw near. Draw near. That's why when they did the sacrifices, they were so, everyone was so excited. And so, they were so happy to be there. They were ecstatic, really. The priest would, like, Pick me for that job. I want to be the shovel guy that takes the coals to the incense offer, uh, offering. I, I want to be the guy that just clears the ashes. I don't care. Ashes guy. I want to be the ashes guy. Every priest had a job, and they were just happy to have one. They, they would draw, like, draw straws kind of thing. I want to be the guy. I want, and, and I'm reading the story, and I'm crying. I, please, please pick me, pick me. Do we do this in the church? Please pick me, pick me. Let me just be that one that claps on the side. Let me just be that one that intercedes while they're preaching. Let me just be that one that worships over here. Let me just be that one that stands. Let me just be that one that says amen. Please, please, please pick me. You know we're kings and priests, right? Do you know who you are? You're kings and priests of the temple. You're the temple. You're kings and priests. Kings and priests right now. Please, please pick me. Please, please, please. I mean, they were lined up and ready to go. And he did it according to families. They would serve a week at a time. A family would serve. And the priest from that family would serve. And then another family would serve. God's into family. He called the Israelites the family. It kind of sounds like mafia. The family. Well, guess what? We're the family. We've, we're grafted in. We're the family. You know. We're the family. I'm the family. You're the family. We're the family. And all the benefits of being in the family, you have it naturally, automatically. Okay. He said that the incense altar would have to be a perpetual offering before the Lord. Perpetual, nonstop. They even had a special, there's a family that has a secret. And that family is still the only family on the planet that knows how to make the incense for that altar. I'm not kidding. <laughs> That's how specific God is about the blueprint and the pattern. Is my worship acceptable, God? Tell me if it's acceptable. I want to know. You know, are we even looking at this? Are we, are we, what do you, what do you want? What do you want? What do you want from me? Do you see the, the humility of this? Do you see? I want it to be acceptable unto you. I'm the temple. I need this to be acceptable. It's not okay just to be nonchalant about this. What's your pattern? Show me your pattern. I got to know your pattern, God. I need to know it. I want to know your pattern. I want to be your pattern. Make me into your pattern. What do you, what's in me that needs to go? What kind of incense do you want from me today? What do you want? You know, it's a really beautiful thing and wonderful thing when the Holy Spirit helps you when you're living your life for God. We have our jobs, and we have our family, and we have our grandbabies. Where is Ivy? Did she leave? <laughs> um, and, and we have all these things we're juggling. And then, but most important, A number one, God, right? He has to be in the first place. 
I'll tell you I, my grandbaby story. You guys saw her. So I asked my son, Perrin, I said, Perrin, please don't ever do anything on Sunday because we have our Sunday meeting over here. And, and Isley loves her mamey, her grandma. That's what she named me. I'm glad she does, okay? Right? She's so sweet and sassy and bossy, right? <laughs> that's her grandpa the other, on the other side. Um, and, and if she's like, and I, I pretty much don't say no. I, I try not to. Um, so here we were on a Sunday afternoon. Because it was my husband's idea. Let's go to the park. Let's take her to see the ducks. So we went and saw the ducks. And it's time for prayer meeting. And I sent a text to TJ. I'm like, I can't go. I, I'm here with Isley because I was in my car and I was getting ready to leave. And Isley was, Mamie, no. No, Mamie, please. Like, I'm, please. You know, and I'm like, ah, that's my grandbaby. I can't, you know, ah, I can't. Ah, it is ripping my heart, ripping my heart out of my chest, ripping it. I could feel it. Oh, it hurt so bad. And I'm like, honey, Mamie has to go. Mamie has to go. I have a responsibility. And I'm like, ah, you know what? TJ could do it. She could do it without me. I'll just have TJ. It's time for a break. I'll just take a break. And uh, I can't do it. I can't do it. I love my granddaughter. And so I, I, I sent her a text, TJ, I need you to take this. I, I can't go. I can't go. I'm here with the grandbaby. I, I just can't. I can't. She was really, she was crying crocodile tears. May, may. <laughs> and in my heart, I'm like, <laughs> I can't do this. I can't. And, uh, and then the Holy Spirit said, don't you dare do that. That's what he told me. Don't you do that. You get in your car and you go. And I'm like, oh, okay. And that's what I'm talking about. It's really, I love it that God talks to me. Even when he spanks me. I want him to spank me. I want to be the pattern. I want to look like the pattern. And I'm not smart enough to do it on my own. I, I need the Holy Spirit. So I hopped in my car and I drove. And uh, when I got there, we're having our permitting and it's time to pray for people. And I'm getting ready to pray for somebody. And God said, you need to repent. I'm like, okay. He said, you put your granddaughter above me. And I said, oh, God, I'm sorry. He said, that's not okay. I'm, I'm sorry, God, please, please forgive me. I'm sorry. And then someone comes along who didn't know anything at all because she didn't know why. She didn't know why I wasn't coming. And she walks up. She goes, I don't know. I have a word. And it's really weird, Cheryl, but God says you're forgiven. <laughs> Isn't God cool? Isn't he so cool? Why would you not? How could anyone not want to live this life? Even getting spanked by God is, 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 is a mystery and a miracle. When he talks to us, it's a mystery and a miracle every time. And he's going to talk to you the same way. And it didn't hurt that bad. He just tell me, Cheryl, you're out of line. You're out of line. You can't love your granddaughter more than me because it's going to even mess her life up. You put her up as an idol, it's going to mess her up. You can't do that. You're going to hurt her. I can't put my husband above God. I can't, I can't put my daughter above God. I can't put my job above God. We still have to do all these things. The Bible says we do them. We have to do them. But we need to have God in first place. And if you do that, everything else lines up. Boom, 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 boom. The blessings Didi was talking about, it lines up. It's a pattern. It's a pattern. He has to have first place. Did you know that the priest that gave the incense offering, one priest got to do it, and this is later because it was Aaron to start off every time. But later on in, in Solomon's temple, one priest got to do it one time in their lifetime. That's it. And there was a reason for it. And it was always a newbie, new priest that came in. They always got to do it. They'd teach him how to do it because you could get burned up. The incense would catch on fire, and you had to do it away from you. You had to go like this, away from you, or you'd catch on fire. Um, I never read anything about, I'm wondering, did anyone ever catch on fire? And I'm curious. I want to know. I'm going to probably be researching. <laughs> I want to know. But um, I thought it was really cool, and there's a scripture to prove it. I like scriptures to prove things. Um, so whenever the priest would go in to do the incense offering, um, that person, and this is what the Jews say, their lives would suddenly get blessed and they would become rich. That's interesting. Yeah. Are you putting out your offering, your incense offering? Every single time it would always be, that's why it would only be one guy because he said it wasn't fair if it was the same guy twice because every time that priest would suddenly become rich and wealthy and he was completely blessed, the guy that did the incense offering. So what does that tell you about our incense offering? 
right? When we, that's our worship and our prayers. It's our worship and our, our, our honor that we give to God. The priest, that'd be me, that'd be you. When we give our incense offering before God, we're blessed and we become rich. And we get to do this every time. We get to take this place every time. In fact, we are the incense offering if we're the bride. It's cool, huh? Ananias and Sapphira were what I would call the half-hearted bride. I know we always use that for finances, but God gave this to me a different way. He said um, they were there with the church right along with everyone else. And they looked like they were giving it all, just like everyone else. But they weren't giving it all, and they deceived the church into thinking they were giving it all. So I'm just going to give you, we're going to give you half, and I'm going to keep half. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to keep half of Cheryl. I'm going to keep the Isley part, my grandbaby, and my husband, and then I'm going to give you what's left, the rest of it, the other half. And so when I go to church and when I'm around my other Christian people, they'll see, oh, Cheryl's giving it all. Look at her go. She's giving it all. And they won't know any better. That was Ananias and Sapphira. But see, the Holy Spirit knew. And I know, they got killed. I hate that story. Boom, right there on the spot. Boom, they got killed. What the, Lord, the Lord showed me this story for this. He said, that's not an acceptable offering. It cannot be alive on the altar. It has to be dead. So the word of God says, you are dead and your life is hid in Christ. For you are dead and your life is hid. That mean, what does, that, does, does that mean my will is dead? It says you are dead and your life is hid in Christ Jesus. Okay, but what if I want to hang out with my grandbaby? I mean, you know that story because I just told you. If God said it's time for you to go to prayer meeting, you should go to prayer meeting. Otherwise, maybe there's something, your will, and you're like fighting against the will of God. How long is God going to keep on, hey, 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 Cheryl, Cheryl, you put another idol up there. The Holy Spirit's there to help us transform into his glorious image. And we need to listen to him when he talks to us. Obedience is better than sacrifice. To me, the sacrifice was not spending time with my grandbaby and waving goodbye as she cries crocodile tears. That broke my heart. That was sacrifice for me, but, but actually it was obedience. So sometimes obedience is sacrifice. But I had to obey God. And God's looking for a bride who will obey him. But I will send a fire upon Judah, and it shall devour the palaces of Jerusalem, Amos 2.5. The palaces in that scripture, I believe, is pride. The original sin was, um, was Satan. If I, if I, if I were God, if I, if I, if I. The I has got to submit to God. And on that surrender is when the fire will ignite and constantly never go out, never, ever go out. It's an abomination to let the fire go out. This is what the bride is called to right now. And I know I'm just, I'm just going over and over the same thing. I'm sorry if this is painful, but it's not painful. <laughs> is it too painful? Okay. The father of faith, Abraham, God promised him, I'm going to give you a son. And out of that seed, with you and Sarah, I'm going to give you a son. And from that seed... There's going to be generations like the sand of the sea and like the stars in the sky from you and Sarah. And we know the story. They, they decided to, let's help figure, figure this out a little bit on our own. They got all involved and like, let me see, we'll try to manipulate the situation so, because we're going to help God out a little bit. And so she gave him her servant for him. She was like a, a surrogate mother, basically, so that she would have the baby instead of Sarah. And then he gave birth to a child. They gave birth to a child, and it's Ishmael. That is now the Muslim nation. I don't know if you know that. And there's a war. There's a war between that nation and Israel right now. These two sons that were born to Abraham. We still live in a time where we can see it with our own eyes. And then God, then she gives birth to Isaac. She was old, right? And God came in with the promise. I told you it's going to be with Sarah. It's going to be with Sarah. In nine months, boom, it happened. When the boy was 12 years old, God came and he said, I want you to sacrifice your son. What? 
going to make me sacrifice the blessing that you gave to me, the very promise you gave to me? But he didn't say that. He submitted and he said, okay. He called him the father of faith. He's the father of our faith. So this is a story to pay attention to if you're a Christian because if the father of our faith had to do this, are we going to have to do it too? And we don't live like that today. So he did it. The Bible says he took his son and his servants and, and a donkey, and, he, and God says, I'm going to tell you where. I'm going to show you the place where it's going to happen. And they went up this mountain, Mount Moriah, and he bound Isaac on the altar, the son that he loved. Talk about crocodile tears. His only son in his old age. And he, but the word says that he believed if he killed him, God was going to raise him up. So he never stopped believing. And as the knife was up, you know the story. A lot of you know the story. The angel stopped him. He's, he's actually going down with the knife, and the angel stops his hand and says, Stop. God has seen that you were willing to sacrifice. You do not slay your son. Look in the bush. There's a, there's a lamb to take his place. An entire nation has been birthed from Isaac from that point on, and it's you, and it's me, and it's the nation of Israel that exists now. There's something that's required of us. The church has got to get to this place where we're willing to lay down our life for him. The Jews, when I study, because I'm studying from the Jews, actually, when I'm studying, they say a person has to feel like their own son is on the altar when they sacrifice to God or that they themselves are there. Their own flesh, their own flesh and blood is there. When God gave his son Jesus, we know he did that, and we always see that type in shadow, but I want to apply it to ourselves because we are, we are that one that's on the altar. And it has to already be slain before it goes on there or it's not even valid. We can't go to church and go, okay, oh, I repent now, God. I, no, that's not, that's not an acceptable offering. You go to church, you're worshiping, you're on the incense altar now. This thing has to already have been done. It's time for us to look at ourselves as the church. So in Chronicles, first Chronicles, uh, Chronicles 21, 26, David built there an altar unto the Lord and offered burnt offerings and peace offerings and called upon the Lord, and he answered him from heaven by fire on the altar of burnt offering. The Lord says, I have found David, the son of Jesse, a man after my heart, who shall do my will. In the last days, God says, I'm going to build the temple of David. Why would he say the temple of David? Because he's a man after his own heart. He's a man who loved God. And that's what God is looking for. He's looking for someone who loves him. He's looking for someone that yearns for him. He's looking for a bride that's in love with him. Like he's in love with her. And that's the one. That's the one whose heart is circumcised unto God. That's the one that he's going to say, that's an acceptable offering. That's the one that's going to get hit with the glory of God. Jesus, when he died on the cross... And he was in the earth. There's a scripture, Matthew 12, 40. For as Jonas was three days and three nights in the, whole, in the well's belly, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. In the heart of the earth. The whole entire earth. He's in the heart of the entire earth. Jesus is the baptizer of fire. So Jesus is the word of God, and he's the baptizer of fire. Is that the moment when the fire on the heart the heart of the temple is the altar. Is that the moment when the heart of the temple, us, was lit for all eternity? It is because the day of Pentecost hit. The day of Pentecost hit on that note. I know. It's over. It's over, it's, maybe it's reaching. <laughs> I'm just repeating it over and over again. But I'm going to end with this. In Malachi 3.1, Behold, I will send my messenger, and he shall prepare the way before me. And the Lord whom you seek shall suddenly come to his temple, even the messenger of the covenant whom you delight in. Do you delight in him? Do you seek him? Yeah. Behold, I will send my messenger, and he shall prepare the way before me, and the Lord whom you seek shall suddenly come to his temple, even the messenger of the covenant whom you delight in. Behold, he shall come, says the Lord of hosts. But who may abide the day of his coming? And who shall stand when he appears? For he's like a refiner's fire. 
and like a fuller soap. And he shall sit as a refiner and purifier of silver, and he shall purify the sons of Levi and purge them as gold and silver, that they may offer unto the Lord an offering in righteousness. Then shall the offering of Judah and Jerusalem be pleasant unto the Lord, as in the days of old and as in the former years. I know, I, I, I know, I know. He's already come. He's already done the work. We've already get saved. We've already, has he come in? Have you let him into every little crevice? Have you let him into every little thing? Have you let him refine you as gold? Laodicea, he said, he said, you're naked, poor, and blind. Ask me to try you so that I can purge you so you can be like gold. Laodicea, the last church age, that's us. Purify me, God. And it's not a sad thing. It's a wonderful thing because he loves us. We're his bride. I want you to purge me. I'm going to kill it. You show me what I need to kill. I'm going to kill it, and then it's going to go on the, on the altar, God, and then your fire is going to hit it, and I'm going to step in, and I'm going to give the incense offering unto you, and you're going to bless me because of it, God, because these go straight up to your nostrils. Do you know the Ark of the Covenant, the poles, it didn't sit like we have the Ark in here. The poles pointed out, and they actually extended them out. They pulled the poles out so that it was as if they were nostrils of God smelling the incense. Isn't that cool? He, he always catches your praise and your worship. Always, 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 always. Every time you turn your mind, your head towards God, every time, even the slightest little whisper, he catches those prayers and the worship. Not just the pleading, but the worship, the love. See, God is love, and worship is loving him. That's the only way to commune with him. You want him to talk to you? You have to first get in the position of his mindset, who he is. He's love. you got to be loving him. And then he starts talking to you. It's easy. It's easy. And tonight, I hope you do it. Worshiping God is loving him. That incense goes up. And the church needs to get herself purified because it's time. We're in a season right now where things are happening. You've seen ISIS. You see Israel surrounded. You, you, see, you see the wars that are going on. You see what's happening in the world. It's been going on for a long time. The, but there are prophets all over, all over the world saying the same things. The time's getting short. The time's getting short. They're saying the same things. God will give one of us a vision, and then we'll read Doug Addison. What? He's saying the exact same thing. The time is getting short. The time is getting short. Purify yourselves. If you're one of the five virgins, get some oil in there. What's the oil, Cheryl? It's the Holy Spirit. The oil is the Holy Spirit. Get some oil in your lamp. Get some oil in there. Because when, when, when someone comes to me and says, Cheryl, I'm going to give all I have, but I've got to have some for me. I still have my job and my grandbaby, and I have all the, of course I'm going to give it away. Pray for the, heal the sick, raise the dead. The oil is constantly coming down. We're going to do this. We need to do this constantly. There's an increase that's coming, and it's going to be, there's a former and the latter rain are coming down together, and the Bible says it's going to happen in one month. Go look. I like to get into the details. In one month. I have it here. It's a love story. God's in love with you. Hmm? I know. The boys, too. God is in love with you. He's in love with you. Because God is love. And he can't do anything else. He's in love with you. And he, okay, see, so if you don't understand the bride, sons, let's go with sons. The only way to commune with him, the only way to get the incense to go up is to love him back. And love is worship. We look kind of crazy in our worship, but it's because, yeah, it's spirit and truth. <laughs> I, I, this is what we say. I want all three parts of me, my mind, my body, and my spirit to line up. And when I'm worshiping God, I'm not going to leave my mind over here thinking about wishing I had Starbucks when my mind needs to be on God. I want to give him a full, 100% full attention when I'm there before him. He deserves no less. He, de he deserves no less than that. And the reason we sometimes move around, you'll see us getting crazy if you've already been here this, today, because I need to line all three 
of, my, of, of myself. I mean, God is a triune being. I'm triune being. I need myself to line up with him. When you do that, you'll notice it gets greater and greater and greater. The measure of his glory is greater when you line yourself up because your spirit already wants to. If you've got the Holy Spirit, it wants to worship. And you can sit there and worship and, yeah, you can do that in your car. But then if you can get your mind there too, oh, oh. But then if you can get your body there too. Yeah. I'm sitting in my car sometimes like this. People are looking at me, and I don't care anymore. I used to care, and I don't care. I'll speak in tongues while I'm driving down the road. I do. I do it every day. I'm busy. I, I don't like how busy I am, but I do it every single day. I drive to work. God, bless, bless me as I go to work, and I start speaking in tongues. I need that fire to stay lit. It's my obligation as the priest of this house to keep my fire lit. It's your obligation as the priest of your house to keep the fire lit. It's not your pastor's job to keep the fire lit. It's your job. You've been called as kings and priests. It took a lot of priests to do the temple service. So we're talking about something corporate here. It took 10 priests to open a gate. 10. Not just one, 10. God is asking for his body to come together as kings and priests now in this season and come together and please give me what you have. I need you to do your part. You might be the guy with the shovel that would take the coals to the incense altar and I might be the girl that, that clears the ashes away and takes it to the place of ashes. We all have to do our jobs. The temple is coming together right now. And it is imperative that every one of us, that the sacrifice that we give is, is valid. It's not, we cannot have something wiggling around on there. That's an invalid. It's invalid. It does not count. It doesn't even work. It does not count. You've got to have a sacrifice that is dead already. And when you bring it before God, it's holy unto him. It's acceptable unto him. What's still alive? Get rid of it. As a high priest, this should, this should already be done. You're a high priest of God. It should already be done. It's time for us to get to business and do this. We've been called unto glory. Called unto glory. Called to be the glorious church. Called for signs, wonders, and miracles. We've already seen them. You've heard the testimonies. But there's something even bigger than, than these one-by-one one testimonies. It's all of us together coming in and saying, I'm taking the land. I'm going to take, I'm going to take it. Where I live, I'm going to take it, and I'm going to make it his footstool. Who will have the guts to do that? Who? Who will have the, who will have the gumption? <laughs> who will have the gumption to be so audacious, if that's the right way to say it, to say, I'm going to take, I'm going to take the land. I'm going to take it for God. You better believe that there's some devils that come out. I'm telling you. But God said, do it. God said, Kern County. And we haven't yet prayed. And I can't let this night end until we pray over Kern County. And if you're from your area, I want you to pray over your area and your territory too. There is God's glory. He said, the knowledge of the glory of the Lord will cover the entire earth. I've seen it in a vision. I've seen it more than once. I've seen it. I've seen it several times. It's going to hit and it's going to go and cover the entire earth. I'm telling you. How's that going to happen, Cheryl? Is it going to come f like with fire from the sky and hit? And we're all going to go, whoa. No, because it's already inside of you. The glory is already in there. It's in there waiting to come out. <sighs> yeah. When you line up, when you line up with the will of God, the pattern of God, you line up with his will completely and you say, I'm living for you. I'm not going to let anything get in the way, God. And, and if it does, tell me, tell me, spank me. It's okay. Spank me. I want you to spank me. I give you permission. I give you permission. I want, I want to be in the pattern because I was born for such a time as this. And I'm going to do what I was born for. And I know you know this in your spirit. I know you know this in your spirit. There's something inside of you. What am I supposed to do with my life? And people go, oh, you're going to be a dad. You're going you're gonna to do this. You're going to do that. Maybe you're going to work wherever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But there's something inside of me going, no, there's, there's something big that I'm supposed to do. And I can feel it. And, and I haven't touched it yet. What is that thing? That thing? I'm telling you. I'm telling you what it is right now. You've been called. You've been born to walk in the glory of God. I am talking to you. I'm talking to you. You've been born for the glory of God, to carry the glory. And I know it sounds scary, like, ah, it's not scary. Fall into his arms, fall into the love of God, and he 
will transform you into his image. It's that easy. Just submit. Okay, God. And I'm not perfect. I watch movies. It's not like I don't watch movies. I love watching movies. I watched Lord of the Rings the other night. I like it. I like movies. But I'm listening to the Holy Spirit. I'm listening. And when something comes on that TV that shouldn't be on there, whew, I'm, it's gone. Whew. I won't listen to something on the radio that's not God. Uh-uh. Uh-uh. I don't want to feed that to my spirit. No way, man. This is a holy place. And if God told me to stop watching TV, I wouldn't be watching it anymore. I, 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 this, is, this is what I'm born for. And I know beyond a shadow of a doubt, I'm going to be transferred in the spirit. Absolutely. I may have already, it may have already happened. <sighs> I'm going to see angels. I've already seen them. I'm not lying to you. I've seen angels. I don't see them all the time like some people, but I've seen them. I'm going to see the gold dust. I've seen that too. We've seen it here. It happens in Firestorm all the time. I'm going to see miracles. I've seen that. I've had a healing in my own body. I've prayed for healing. Someone was healed of AIDS in here. I got to be one of the ones that was part of that prayer. That was amazing. Went back to the doctor. AIDS was gone. I've seen these things myself, but I want to see it all the time. I want to see it all the time. So what is it going to take for me, God? What is it going to take? I'm still waiting. You could get discouraged and go, oh, man, it didn't happen. I prayed for them to be healed, and it didn't happen. You got a 50-50 chance that it will happen. How's that? Those are good odds, right? You should always try. You should always do it because God's transforming you into his image. He wants you to become his image. He's going to marry someone who's equally yoked to him. The manifested sons of God are rising up, and it's you, and it's me, and it's now. It's now. I'm telling you there's a shaking. 2015 starts on September 24th. The glory is hitting. It's already hitting. It's hitting now. You should expect it tonight. God said, the seventh time you pray over Kern County, the walls are going to come down. You're going to see something big. Okay, God, I don't know what that looks like. He said, I only ask you to do one thing. Obey me and believe me. I'm like, Cheryl, you look like a crazy lunatic. I know. I know. You know what? He's, my greatest joy is to live for him. I love him so much. I, I'm just going to do what he says. Oh, are you sure you're hearing right? I'm pretty sure because... Like, I've got people that I hang out with that hear the same thing I'm hearing. And people giving me, I, I had a vision, Cheryl. Guess what it was? Like, Christine. All the time. We've had how many prophets come through Kern County? I don't know, five, six, seven people that's come through and s come here and said, God's getting ready to hit this land. Yeah, big time people. Big, big time people, right? Like, Stacey Campbell, uh, Sherlock Valley, um, B.J. Hilton, Give me some, there's someone that on TV that just came through this weekend, and same thing. This area is marked. It's marked. So if you're a Kern County person, would you believe with me? And expect it. I mean more than believe. Get it in your spirit. He said, uh, pay attention to my times and pay attention to the threes. So, so um, I started studying because he gets me on those tracks and I study. And uh, what I'm going to read to you.